Good everyone, I hope you guys have an amazing day. Um, so today what I'll do, I will have a conversation with you guys about how to be successful in so Salesforce development career, right? If you're aiming to be a Salesforce developer, what are all the things you should know to be successful in that role? Um, I have done two videos, uh, I believe one in 2020. Um, I remember doing about the things you should know before you go and appear for a Salesforce development role interview. And then I did something similar, I believe, in 2022. Now, this is 2024, August 30, as you can see on my laptop, um, that, you know, that a lot of things have changed, right? And the expectations have changed. Uh, and the things which I mentioned back in 2022, uh, though uh, a lot of them are relevant, some of them are not relevant. You know, you might need to know more stuff. So that's exactly, you know, what I wanted to talk about in this episode, right? So I'm not going to do any hands-on, so it's just me talking. Now, you must be thinking, why Why should we listen to you, right? Well, look, I have a lot of experience in the Salesforce ecosystem, and I work as a Salesforce technical architect in New Zealand. And as far as the programming is concerned, I started a coding when I was 10. I started with the basics, then I moved to C, then C++, then I worked on, um, then I worked um, with Delphi, then, then I even did some small talk. If anybody remembers small talk um, programming language, or object-oriented one. Um, I, work, I work on Python most of the time because I'm heavily involved in, in deep learning space. Um, I have worked uh, in a bit of, uh, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of work on uh, Apex and I've done a lot of work on LWC, JavaScript. So yeah, and even even now I do a lot of uh, dev work as a POC, right? Because obviously my role does not require me to go and code, but I get tempted at times to build a POC. So I do, you know, POC here and there. And I interview a lot of Salesforce developers, and I and I see sometimes I do get an opportunity to mentor them as well. Um, so I'm telling from an experience and uh, looking at uh, other people I interviewed, working with them, and some of the skill set I sometimes feel they they should have but they don't. And at times the kind of, kind of frustrations I had at times working with some of the developers in the past. Um, so. And, and I mean, I actually don't like to call it as a frustration, right? I like to call it as an opportunity, right? Because uh, my apologies, I shouldn't be using the word frustration, should be using the word opportunity. Opportunity to train somebody, uh, you know, to uplift their skill set. Yeah, that's that's the way I look. Because I'm, I don't like to talk about things what other persons are not doing, right? I wanted to talk about things we can help uh, together, you know, to improve the way I put it. Okay. So, uh, enough of, you know, me talking, you know, gibberish, but okay. So the first thing first, right, obviously to be successful in a Salesforce development role, you need to have, uh, you need to first of all think as an admin first, right? That's the first thing it may, you may or may not heard about someone saying this, you need to think like a Salesforce admin first. The reason why I say that, you need to have a basic understanding of the things that happens in a Salesforce ecosystem, right? Uh, so you need to know how to configure a user. You need to know how to configure a profile, how to configure a role, how to assign a role, how to assign a profile, uh, you know, how to add a user to permission set, how to create a permission set group, and how to do you know, configuration, how to create an object, how to add a field, how to <clears throat> enable field uh, history tracking, um, how to create a report. You need to know all of this stuff, right? How to create an app. Uh, so it's very important that you have that Salesforce admin skill. Otherwise, you're going to struggle. I'm telling you, right? And you need to pay attention to admin stuff, right? That's why, you know, look, I'm an architect, right? And I still follow admin stuff, right? It's very useful. And a lot of admin stuff out there is really, really helpful. So if you are aspiring to be a Salesforce developer or a Salesforce developer wants to be a lead developer, I lead Salesforce developer, I would expect, I would 
advise you to spend time with Salesforce admins, see what they're doing, and share ideas, right? Because admins, some of because the problem what we have, right? When when people talk of admins, they think, oh, this is a junior position. It's not a junior position. So I have seen senior admins, they're very, very good, right? Some of the senior admins even code. So um, I worked with some of the very talented uh, senior admins who are who are principal consultants, right? So they have extraordinary consulting skills and as well as admin skills, right? Um, so it's very important that you wear the admin hat, right? Before you know getting into code and other you know good stuff. So that's very important, guys, right? If you wanted to be a very good Salesforce developer, consider spending some time with Salesforce admin. Um, attend uh, Salesforce admin. Uh, you know, if, if there's an admin online user conference, I would highly encourage you to attend. At least tune in to see what they're talking about, the cool stuff they talk about to make. Because see, the admins don't like the code. I'm, uh, I'm not saying every admins, but most of them, right? So they often try to, you know, do things to make the life of a user, and they often um, engage with the users more than the developer does. So that's an opportunity you get uh, to, you know. Um, to see how the the entire user journey, right? Because after all, whatever you do in the Salesforce, right? It's for the user, right? It could be an internal user, could be for external user, right? Okay, now come to Apex. It's very important that you guys should know Apex. Now, I have seen people writing Apex code in the procedural way, which is a very bad way to write it because Apex is an object-oriented programming language, right? I haven't seen people using inheritance uh, I haven't seen people using interfaces, though I do understand that you might say, why are we over-engineering it, right? My philosophy is that you need to code to abstraction, not to implementation, right? And the problem people don't use interfaces because their lack of knowledge on design patterns, right? There are a lot of design patterns out there like factor pattern, facade pattern, um, you, you know, observer pattern, and command pattern, builder patterns, right? I've used a lot of this stuff, right? And so it's important that, I mean, you don't really have to use design pattern for everything because, you know, sometimes you don't need it. Like factor pattern I've used extensively because, and facade pattern as well. Builder pattern, you might have seen some of the libraries out there. They use extensively the builder pattern, build uh, command pattern too, perhaps. So to use this pattern, you need to understand object-oriented programming language object-oriented aspect of Apex, uh, end-to-end, right? You need to know what an abstract class is. You need to know what a virtual method is. You need to know when to call the different kinds of polymorphism, what is a static polymorphism, what is a dynamic polymorphism, and you need to understand when to use it, right? I mean, I'm not saying just to learn it, to clear the interview. That's not what I was getting at. I'm trying to say to use it in a real-time application so that you can get the best out of it. We should start using Apex as an object-oriented language, not as a procedure language, right? Okay, now I talked about design pattern. Um, it will be good if you guys want to, to know more about design pattern. Look, I have I published my first book in Apex design pattern. Uh, I will put the link in the description below if you want. You you know, please go and buy it. Uh, a few people reached out to me; they find it very valuable. So hopefully, uh, you will find it valuable as well. It contains mostly code, uh, some diagrams talking about different patterns. So yeah, okay. Uh, so that comes to the apex, right? And now comes to LWC. It's very very important. You need to you have a good understanding of LWC. Gone with those times where, you know, you could easily get by using Visual Force or Aura component. Although I would say Aura, we st some companies still use Aura and they're migrating to LWC, the Lightning Web component. Um, but the, the uh, Visual Force page, um, there might be a legacy here and there, but I won't really uh, expect anyone to, you know, to start building stuff using Visual Force page, right? That's, that's a big no. Um, you, you should have a good understanding of LWC, uh, how LWC works, different events. Uh, basically, you know, it uses JavaScript, right? And it's a JavaScript framework from Salesforce. Now, you need to have a good understanding of JavaScript. Uh, and even if you wanted to know 
you know the design pattern that's great and you need to know the latest ECMAScript um, keep up to date with what's happening in that f world because once you know JavaScript very well right you can easily switch between React uh, Vue.js right and and Node.js Node.js uh, for the server side stuff, right? And they might, you might be working in a company where people might be using Node.js, right? It's good to know JavaScript, in my honest opinion, right? And good to know really well, right? So um, that will help you write better LWC. And it's also very important to know HTML, uh, CSS, because obviously you'll be styling your code. Um, and that now you might you might wonder, do we really need to know LWC? Don't we have Omni? Yes, we do have Omni, right? But you might have existing components in place, right? Which you might want to uh, uh, change, right? You can't go to a new company and say, hey, let's move everything to Omni. It's not going to happen, right? Because it costs money. And and company will not be interested to, uh, to take on board with the new product. First of all, you need to train people on the new product, uh, so new tool set, right? When I said new product, I mean new tool set, in this case, Omni, right? And very not everyone has a good understanding of Omni, right? So it's going to cost company a lot of money if you're recommending a company to use um, Omni, right? So when everything is built using LWC. So it's very important you guys have a good understanding of LWC, uh, the right way to code. Uh, proper error handling is very important. And see, there are different books out there you can get to know about some of the design patterns. Like I'm very big on design pattern because it helps you to write very clean code, clean and maintainable code, right? Now, um, now comes to the most important part uh, in Salesforce, that's the unit testing, right? I understand that unit testing can be frustrating because especially if you're under critical time pressure, but remember guys, you cannot push your code, right, without 75%. But that being said, I would highly encourage you to aim for 95, right? Because what happens is that when you aim for 95, you end up in writing a very good unit test. When you end up in writing a very good unit test, uh, you will cover the positive and negative scenario. And when you do that, the chances of hidden bugs sneaking out will be very little. Otherwise, what happens, you're putting too much of pressure on functional testing team to find out those hidden bugs, which is very, very bad. And that is not a sign of a good or a principal developer, right? So if you wanted to be very talented developer, you need to start taking ownership, right, of your stuff you write and the stuff you test. It's very important. It's all about ownership. And if you don't take ownership of your work, it's going to make it it's going to make the job of you, it will make your life difficult in any organization because someone else will start complaining, hey, this guy is not testing his code. This guy is adding more bugs. So you know what I mean? And eventually the company will get rid of people. I've seen that happen many times. Now comes the, 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 uh, the important, now I spoke about the code side, right? Because obviously we are developers, we wanted to know about the code, right? Now there's something called the low code aspect in Salesforce, flows. Very important uh, because flows are, Salesforce has been heavily pushing flows, right? And there's a huge expectation. You shouldn't be doing a lot of things in code. You should be using a lot of things in flows, which is fine, right? Because I believe everything has a use case. And if, if your use case justifies using flow, go for it. But I do not like to get into argument, oh, low code is better than, uh, you know, you know f full code, because that is not the way a developer think or talk, right? Because the, the sole responsibility of developer is not, not to code, is to solve a business problem, right? Now, it's up to you to decide if the code fits this requirement or you or you can better off using flows, right? Because flow is not just about drag, dragging and dropping the component and start a building, uh, you know, the business logic. When you write a flow, you need to think like a developer. You need to think about a modularity. You need to think about reusability. So that's where the subflows comes into picture, right? And you should also think about avoiding duplicacy, right? I have seen spaghetti flows, which is one of the worst 
flows you can ever write, right? Where people are putting every damn logic in the same flow with no consideration for separation of concern. And that is not how a developer should do things, right? So if you if you end up in doing that, right? If if it comes to me for a code review, I straight up decline it because for me, when I look at the flow, I look at is your flow modular? Can I reuse the flow? What happened to the subcomponent? Let's say, for instance, I wanted to use a logger component in a flow, right? So are you going to uh, create a logger component in every flow you're using, or are you going to use a subflow, a creative flow uh, called the logger flow and hook that as a subflow uh, in, in flows you're writing, right? Pay special attention to the, uh, the exceptions that happens in the flow. It's very important. So the key role of a Salesforce developer, in my honest opinion, is not just to write a code. It just is to solve a business problem and to solve it in such a way that your company can make a profit out of the stuff you're building, right? Because we shouldn't be adding tech depth. The more you add tech depth in terms of, you know, the buggier code, uh, less error handling, um, less um, modularity, you're adding more cost to the company to fix the tech depth in the later stage. Yeah. So pay attention to the flows. And it's very important to understand the flows. Uh, like there are different kinds of flows, right? You know, screen flows, record trigger flows, platform event flows, uh, schedule flows, right? So you need to have a good understanding of that when to use it. And, and you need to try it out before you, you know, uh, come up with a solution. Now comes to the most important part, uh, Omni Studio, right? Now, I know it's, it's a part of, it's part of Industry Cloud and Salesforce is aggressively pushing uh, Omni. Now, I have used Omni a lot, right? Omni is a great product uh, because you, it contains FlexCard, it contains uh, integration procedure, it contains Omni Script. You know, there are a lot of moving parts to it. Uh, now, that being said, right, we don't have a good Omni developers in the market. I'll be very honest. It's not about dragging and dropping a component, you know, writing a few JSON stuff here and there, writing a few transformation. That's not what it is, right? You still need a proper design pattern. So when I look at someone talks about flex cards, I ask them, do you understand a container pattern architecture? If they say no, then then I will ask him, what kind of Omni are you using for all these years, right? Um, <laughs> Then integration procedure, right? The very common example, we have a try-catch exception. I have seen people using integration procedure with try-catch and nothing inside the catch block. I, I, uh, I thought for a second, what's the point if you're not capturing the error, right? So that's all the things you need to pay attention as a developer. And these are the things I look for, you know, when I do the code review or doing the interview process, right? And and if a developer is proactive enough, right, they will at least try to come up with new ideas, you know, improvements. And yeah, so it's very important, right? You know, you understand the, the core foundation and then it's very important that you try to see if you can use any design pattern. Like, like I said, like guys, I'm very big on design pattern. It helps you to solve a specific problem, right? And it helps you to solve in a very effective way. Okay. Now, obviously, you know, there are a lot of things um, you can use um, in a salesforce right ecosystem from a developer standpoint now what i really want you to think about right if you want to be an exceptional developer is that are you taking initiative to um clear the tech depth now you must be thinking what does that even mean right so i have seen right in my development career as well as an architect career that when a developer touches a code right if you're an exceptional developer, you will go and fix it and, you know, make it better, right? When you're, but if you're an average developer, you'll say, oh, okay, I'll add a line of a code. Why bother, right? That's a very bad way, right? Because that's, that's not a good developer. Style. And now you can say, hey, look, uh, we don't have much time. That's all BS excuse, to be honest, right? If you're a good developer, right, you should have a good instinct to know which part of a component I should fix it. But remember, when you fix it, you need to fix the unit test, right? And you need to test it very well. And 
right? That's that's very important. And um, another thing to be successful as a Salesforce developer, consider mentoring junior developers. It gives you an opportunity to uh, train them when you try to teach people. Um, it becomes very easier for people to, you know, uh, to work with you because they, they see you as the mentor and you can help them in their journey and opportunity to, you know, do uh, pair programming together or pair flows together, right? And also help them with their queries. So, and that will also improve your knowledge because at times, you know, you may not get opportunity to work on every aspect of the Salesforce, right? So if working with junior developers uh, often gives you an opportunity to, you know, look at things which you often overlook. The most important thing, the knowledge of DevOps. It's extremely important, right? You have a knowledge of Git. If you do not know how to use Git, then it's not going to work out very well for you, I'm afraid, right? Because you're obviously going to use Visual uh, Studio Code, right? Or whatever ID. And obviously, you're going to push your code to a repo. Could be a GitHub, depending what repo you use in your organization, right? Uh, could be... Um, <clears throat> Uh, a Bitbucket or GitLab or, or or whatever, right? I mean, let me put that way. Um, so you need to have a good understanding of the Git commands, when to use it, right? When to you know, code merge, uh, all kind of stuff you need to know, right? And if you struggle with that, that's going to cause frustration with the team. Because if you do not know how to merge your code, how to resolve the merge conflict, it's going to be a challenge for your tech lead or who are reviewing code, right? Because then... I understand that if you're starting out, then it you may or may not aware, but it's very important, right? Because the biggest issue in Salesforce ecosystem, people who knows flows, they call themselves as a programmer, and then they don't know how to work with the Git. They're not programmers. They're functional consultants. There is a huge difference. So, yeah, it's very important, like I said, right, to have a good understanding of the Git and always be proactive in learning, right? That's my sincere advice. Go and attend the user conference, talk to developers, you know, see what the problems they're trying to solve and share tips and uh, try out open source products, right? And maybe uh, put something out in a GitHub if you're interested. And, and you know, some interviews, they might ask, have you used any frameworks? Like for instance, have you used any logger framework or any unit test framework or any trigger framework, right? Uh, so if you have used it like a trigger action or a nebula logger or, you know, financial force lab, so you will know, right, what these people are asking. So it's good to be, uh, good to know. And you also should have a good understanding of a static code analysis tool. Could be a PMD, could be Clayton, could be code scan, could be anything, Right. Uh, because obviously, you know, most of the companies, what they do um, when they build their pipeline, right, uh, as a DevOps pipeline, like CICD, they integrate PMD uh, or Clayton to it, uh, or for that matter, any, any other static code analysis. Well, some companies do their in-house. So what normally that will do, it will run the code, scan on your code and your flows and other metadata. And if there is an error or if there is a, an issue based on the rules, the specifier, let's say your code uh, naming convention is incorrect or your uh, code has too many params uh, than expected, that, that, sorry, than required, it will give an error. Yeah. So that's, it's very important that you guys understand these things because in my uh, honest opinion, um, it's very important that you need you guys should follow in industry standards like CodeScan is one of them, um, frameworks are one of them, and the best way to write a code is one of them, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So, and now uh, also uh, you should have at least a good understanding of the clouds, right? Sales cloud, service cloud, at least some some foundation understanding of different clouds. A marketing cloud, perhaps, at least an overview. What is it about? Marketing cloud is a different thing, right? They have AMP script. They have uh, server-side JavaScript. It's a little bit different. 
Uh, if you're interested in the marketing cloud, I can do a separate video, but this is more specific on the Salesforce, right? Um, and so let me recap what I've said, right? I hope it's, it's, it's valuable what I've said so far and I haven't ranted too much. So when you are uh, going for a Salesforce development role, right? Or when you want, to, or if you want, if you're aspiring to be a great Salesforce developer, good understanding of an Apex, LWC, Flows, Omni Studio, right? And and Salesforce admin knowledge is important. So now comes to a most important question: How important are the Salesforce certification? Look, I honestly don't care about certification, though I teach people how to get certified. So you might say, hmm, that doesn't make sense. But the reason why I'm saying, right? Um, people across the world, a different tech step, not just specific to Salesforce, they use dumps to clear the cert. And I've seen people with no experience having damn 20 certs. And I'm like, dude, I'm a damn technical architect. I don't have 20 certs. <laughs> and when I start an interview, they, they struggle with the basic, uh, you know, uh, the uh, basic question, uh, basic uh, queries, right? And I ask them to, you know, I tell them, I, I remember I interviewed one guy. I don't want him to name anything. I said, look, guy, tell me <clears throat> uh, the best way to write an Apex method. So what are the first, what are the things you look for when you wanted to write an Apex method, right? He couldn't answer me that. And he got like lots, eight to nine years experience. I'm like, are you serious, Paul? You said you've done a lot of, and you can't tell me the best way to write an Apex method. So that's why I don't really trust certifications, right? It's good to get certified. I'm not saying you should not. Like I've done a course on, free course, in fact, right? On YouTube, uh, Platform Dev 1, complete series, Platform Dev 2, complete series. If you like it, please go and take it. And I grateful to my subscribers. I'm absolutely grateful and I'm really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm truly are uh, because 100 people reach out to me and say, hey, my your course, free course has helped us to get certified, which is fantastic news to hear, right? At the end of the day, that's that's the reason why I created my channel to help people, right? It it, it makes me feel better, right, to help people. So, uh, <clears throat> so now one important thing you should also know uh, that uh, external services, right? So, um. I don't know if you've used external service or used external service. If you wanted to connect to an external uh, API, uh, you know, you can use external service. And using external service, you can, you know, integrate uh, Salesforce with the third-party API uh, using Flows or, yeah, and Apex. Now, one of the most common questions I get asked, should we be writing unit tests for Flows? And the answer to that question is you should. Right, because unit tests, like I said, is just not writing something there uh, to do a cert and putting true true to just to pass the test. It's to make sure you are testing the right things so that you're not putting enough pressure, so that you're not putting pressure on your functional or uh, an automation tester. So it's your prime responsibility as a developer to test your code. It doesn't matter flows or Apex or LWC. Now, coming to LWC, I would highly encourage you to know Jest. JavaScript testing framework, it's very popular. It's used for React. It's used for Vue.js. I would highly encourage you to learn that and please try to see if you can use it. It will help you to test your JavaScript uh, LWC code, right? And it's very easy to use, though, right? And these are the things I would expect you to know. And uh, now developers also, if you're a developer, you should also have a good understanding of integration, right? Because obviously Salesforce integrates with different systems. So it could be with the Mool, could be with uh, SAP. So Mool is like a you know middleware, right? So you can use Moolsoft um, uh, to connect to different uh, third-party vendors like SAP, um, Oracle, or, you know, Azure, or whatever, right? Um, so just a Bamboo HR. Uh, so now you must be wondering, should should you know, uh, do you, sh ah. 
This is Friday, and for some freaking reason, I can't pronounce any damn thing. My apologies for that. Uh, so, do you have to know Moolsoft, right, before you go and apply for a Salesforce in developer job? Not really, I would say. It depends. If a business is looking for a Mool and Salesforce together, then yes. But it might... But if you get an opportunity to learn Mool, I would highly encourage you to at least do a Mool developer uh, thingy, right? It's very easy to use Mool software. It's all like flows. If you're comfortable with flows, uh, you know, you can use Mool. They have a data weaver script, which is pretty good script for data transformation. So Mool is really great product, right? I've used Mool, so it's um, you don't really need to know, but it's, it's good to know, right? So if you want to stand out in the market, right? I would highly encourage you to learn more, at least from a developer standpoint, not from an architecture perspective. Um, and now talking about integration, right? You should have a basic understanding of integration patterns, like uh, request and reply, you know, fire and forget, data synchronization. And so, which means that you should have a good understanding of platform events, change data capture, even driven architecture, right? Um, you should also have a good understanding of the name credentials. Obviously, you know you can't put the damn passport in your code. You should you, you should be using uh, name credentials and should have a good understanding of the security side of things, right? Protocols, old protocols, right, and uh, all this kind of stuff. And you should have some idea about not some sorry good idea about REST and other stuff. And when I said about the security, right, you should know, like I said. Uh, how to use permission set profile. That's why I said you need to have an admin knowledge. When you have an admin knowledge, you know you will have obviously have a good understanding about the, all this admin stuff, right? Profiles, permission set, what each means, and kind of stuff, right? So that's why I clearly mentioned in the beginning. So I don't really have to go to the nitty gritty side of stuff, because the thing is that Salesforce is evolving. Sorry, evolving every release. And they're adding more and more changes to it. Now they're adding data cloud. Now you should be, if you're asking, should I learn data cloud? It's pretty new, right? So it's not necessary at this stage, but it might be needed maybe in a year's time, a couple of years time. And now you, you might be asking, should I learn, should I be looking to upgrade myself on Salesforce AI? Salesforce AI is primitive. Right. I mean, to be honest, it's it's all bloody hype. I mean, I now you must. I'm not. I'm not exaggerating, right? To be honest, because I built my damn large language model on climate change. I've been doing AI since 1999, right? So when I went to MIT, so my I did. I, I wrote the damn AI compiler, so I know what I'm talking about. Um, the AI, what we have today's time, the generative AI, which is based on the transformer architecture, is exceptionally good AI, right? Uh, you look at Meta, what they're doing, look at Google, what they're doing, look at OpenAI. Salesforce, it's okay. I mean, it's not, it's not great at this stage, but if you really wanted to learn AI, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going off topic. I would highly encourage you to learn machine learning algorithms, deep learning algorithms, Python exceptionally well, and a bit of a statistics, right? And algebra, linear algebra, uh, we'll get, and a bit of a calculus. We'll get you started, right? And then you can use your all those fancy uh, local tools, right? And all those models out there, open source Meta has outsourced their Llama model, uh, you can use that open source. You can uh, so open AI. You can use, uh, you can build, um, you know, and try if you wanted to use PyTorch kind of stuff, right? I, I don't want, really want to get into the, the AI conversation, but from a Salesforce AI perspective, um, the Copilot, uh, yes, you can learn if you like. I mean, it's, you know, you can build prompt engineering using the prompt builder. Uh, you can build, uh, Hook your copilot, uh, Einstein copilot with Apex, custom Apex or flows, and even with the you know templates, the prompt templates uh, to do you know, build your chat, uh, Gen AI uh, capabilities. You can do that. Uh, at this stage, I would say 
uh, expectation is not very high that you should know this because it's pretty new. And I, like I said, right, it's not at the very great advanced stage to do anything meaningful, at, you know. So it's just all marketing, right? That That's all I would say. Salesforce wants to increase their shares. They want to market their AI capabilities. So they are pushing very hard using their data cloud and gen AI capabilities in code. So uh, coming to the main topic, right? Um, Apex, LDBC, Flows, Omni Studio, uh, knowledge of some clouds, uh, even an architecture like platform event, uh, change data capture, uh, admin knowledge, uh, unit test frameworks. Um, well, this will get you sorted. And uh, yeah, and one more thing, the DevOps knowledge, right? So if you are confident in these skills, you will smash any interview out there, right? Because uh, that's more important uh, to, you know, to know. It's very important to know the foundation, right? And once you are clear with the foundation, uh, you can smash any interview out there in the world. So that's all I wanted to talk. I, I know my apologies. I, I've spoken for, for maybe more than 20 minutes. And so, I, but I wanted to share my perspective, right? Like I said, I work as a technical architect. I work in a government organization. I look after the entire Salesforce ecosystem, right? I'm the architect of the entire Salesforce ecosystem. And it's a, it's a very big government agency I work for. So, and I look after different products, uh, pro- projects, sorry. And so I interact with different developers day to day, look after the architecture side of things, um, look after, you know, I talk to different architects from different technology, AWS, uh, Oracle, um, Azure, Mulsoft. So, yeah, it's an opportunity, right? I'm, I think... I'm more in a privileged position if I if I put that way, right? Because I get an opportunity to talk to AI people, to you know anywhere Salesforce. I own the entire uh, uh, Salesforce architecture uh, because it it falls under me, um, and then I get an opportunity to talk to different developers, get to understand the concern, and provide my feedback. So and then opportunity to you know, brainstorm with architects from a different tech, tech stack. Uh, that's why I said it's, it's really, I'm a consumer of highly, I'm totally grateful and it's really in a privileged place, uh, to be honest. Um, and I get to do the stuff I wanted to do, right? So like, so that's the advantage, right? I, and I, and I get to work from home most of the time and I don't like to commute, right? To be honest, because I'm an introvert, I if if I commute right because I live in New Zealand right I mean our trains are good um, I commute I, I'm very quiet person right I I don't talk to any people right I I talk to people when I have to when we are doing a business problem I don't like to you know do small conversation it's just waste of my time um, that's my personality right um, so yeah so I hope this video is helpful. And if you guys have any questions or concern, uh, give me a shout, right? And if and if you think that oh this guy is, is speaking shit, you're most welcome to say that as well. I'm <laughs> I I'm always open to all kind of feedback and suggestions, right? Because at the end of the day, I'm doing this video for you guys, right? So uh, so that I can help you out there. And if you think that I should have said something else, please do let me know. I can cover that in the next episode. So that being said, you guys have an amazing Friday. Adios.